Hey, Ochemsters, this is Mrs. Vanoy bringing you some more Ochemstar video. We are still in the intro section and we are on page 10. And now we're going to be talking about intermolecular forces. We also abbreviate that as IMFs. Now, what did I really enunciate? The inter. So, what does that prefix inter mean? It means between, all right? So this is between the molecule forces is what we're going to be talking about today. And this is big news, okay? We learned in the last video about Vesper and polarity that structure determines function. And we're going to show you more specifically why that is in this section, all right? So hold on to your hats and let's get going. So it says structure determines function. Um, and it, the structure determines what? Why does it determine the function? It determines the strengths of the forces. Now, if you would like, why don't you write the word attraction above the word force? So think of the idea of attraction between the molecules. So that's what we mean by force. So structure determines the strengths of the attractions that determines whether the substance is a solid, liquid, or gas. So where do you think the attractions, where do you think the forces are the greatest in between the molecules or you know from one molecule to another well i think the solid has the most attraction that's why they're close together so which one do you think has the least attraction to one another it's definitely the gas they're pretty independent and the liquids in between all right so here's this definition the intermolecular force is the force that holds one molecule to another okay all right, so I've made a big deal about intermolecular force. So what's the other force we could be talking about? And that's called the intermolecular force. That's what the between is. And now we have the intramolecular force. So what's the difference? Well, that prefix inter means between and intra means within. So the force inter is between these molecules the intra is, in a sense, the bond, okay? So I'll write that. It's between one molecule to another, and the intra is the force of one bond within the molecule. So how strong is this hydrogen and oxygen right here uh, bound, all right? So let me ask you this. If I were to boil water, what do you make when you see the bubbles? Are you making hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, or are you making water vapor? Well, think about it. If you have a, a nice smelly candle nearby your stove and you're making hydrogen and oxygen gas, you're gonna blow up your stove, all right? You are not making hydrogen and oxygen gas, you're just making steam. Why is that? Which attraction do you think is greater? The greater here, the bonds, or between the molecules? Well, it's definitely the bonds. You're not breaking these bonds when you boil water, you're breaking the intermolecular force when you boil water, okay? So anyway, I'm gonna have to do the demo when I see you live, so we'll just kind of skip over that one. And so there are three basic forces, okay? So we'll start with the one that everyone has. Every single uh, you know, molecule or every single atom is gonna have some kind of London dispersion forces. These are also known as, believe it or not, van der Waal forces. Yes, that's right, the van der Waal force. Johann van der Waal was the one that came up with this idea. He was trying to figure out how can we liquefy gases. And so this is his conclusion, all right? So uh, I don't know when it became the one in dispersion forces, but that's the more common way, unfortunately. Anyway, what are these things? These are the result of fluctuations in what? In the electron distribution within the molecules or the atoms. These are present in all molecules and present in all atoms. Why? Because they all have electrons. So it is called an instantaneous dipole on any helium atom induces an instantaneous dipole on neighboring atoms within will attract others. So let me kind of show you how this picture comes to be. All right, so this is Mrs. Vandoy's blow-up version of helium. Why, how do I know it's helium? It has two protons and two protons, or it has to be helium. So what's going to happen? As 
I can create either a pressure or a temperature difference. So really, 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 really high temperature, or sorry, sorry, high pressure, excuse me, or a really, 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 really low temperature, I can get these helium molecules to get closer. So maybe I'd, I'm working at the pressure. So I'm squeezing these molecules closer and closer and closer and closer. Eventually, what's going to happen? What's going to happen right here? These electrons are going to repel each other. All right, so these electrons are going to try to get as far away from each other as possible. Okay, so there you go. So now this electron is far away from this electron, but what else is going to happen? I can get that closer. Why would that be something to talk about? Because what is now happening? There is now an attraction between the nucleus of this helium atom and the outer electrons of the right-hand atom, okay? So that's the instantaneous dipole. Now what happens if for whatever reason, this, hydro, this helium starts going, oops, come on, starts going this way. How come he won't move? There we go, starts going away. Are these electrons forced into you know, that position? The answer is no. Can those electrons, I'm trying to do, there we go, uh, go back to where they were? I give up here. All right, yeah, sure they can. All right, it all depends on how many other electrons are close by. So they call it an instantaneous dipole because it's not permanent. It happens if they get close to each other and then you can have some attraction. And then, you know, as the other molecule leaves or the other atom leaves, it can go away. All right, so it's not a permanent dipole. So that's what this picture is trying to show you. I thought mine was kind of clever because I was actually moving stuff, all right? But when these electrons are getting closer here, you're forcing those electrons further away, creating this ne uh, partial negative. And where there's a void and there's just the nucleus, there's your partial positive. And here's your attraction between the two, okay? All right, so my mine is maybe a little bit cruder, but I think it gives a nice visual. Let's go on to the next page. So what does this do for us? Well, the greater the attraction, we have a few things we'll notice. The greater the boiling point and the harder it is to evaporate, okay? So the greater the dispersion forces, more energy is required to separate these forces. So the boiling point increases and the rate of evaporation goes down. They remain in that liquid phase longer. So if I were to look at the uh, noble gases, all right, check out the molar masses. All right, what's happening? As the molar mass increases, what's happening to boiling point? Helium's boiling point is 4.2 Kelvin. That's crazy, all right? And then all the way up to xenon is, is 165. So that's again, Kelvin is definitely below freezing, but um, it's still a lot higher than helium. So what's happening as molar mass goes up, all right, boiling point goes up, all right? Well, now my question is, well, why? All right, why is that? Okay, so I need a little room here. Well, here is the answer. As the molar mass increases, the number of electrons increase. Okay, therefore, you have greater polarizability. That's that shifting of electrons. All right, that's the electrons getting away from the other electrons. All right, so once you have that polarizability, you have set up that partial positive, partial negative. Well, if you do that, you have more attraction, and therefore you have greater IMFs, intermolecular forces. So with greater intermolecular forces or with greater attractions, the more energy it takes to separate the liquid molecules, so the greater the boiling point. Now, if you are taking AP chemistry, you need to know that word. All right, that, that paragraph there, okay? Uh, that's what the AP wants you to state. Now, for organic chemistry, hey, what the heck? Just know the more electrons, that more that, that partial positive and partial negative shows up, all right? And that's greater attraction, all right? And it's going to be harder to separate. Now, my next question is, does boiling point, let me scroll down here, does uh, boiling point depend on molar mass only? And the answer is no. So consider n-pentane. We're going to learn, once we really start um, doing uh, real organic, what the n means. n means normal or straight-chained. There are no branches. 
So normal pentane is a straight chain pentane right here. All right. And then there's something called neopentane. That's a really old way of saying that. Um, but this is the idea of neopentane. So kind of let me show you what's happening here. What do these look like? All right. Let me show you. So those are the basic structural formulas of normal or straight chain uh, pentane and this neopentane. What do they have in common? They all have five carbons, 12 hydrogens. So if they have the same uh, molecular formula, they have the same molar mass, don't they? So it, they have the same number of electrons, but there's more to it. Look at the difference in boiling point. Your boiling points tell you the strengths of attraction. All right, so what's going on here? All right, well, what's happening? Normal pentane has a greater boiling point as it has no branches. It's a straight chain. Neopentane has a lower boiling point as it has two branches. So why is that? Why do the branches have something to do with it? Well, the more branches, the harder it is for that molecule to get close enough uh, to affect the attraction to the other molecule. Like here, just think of this, like, like spaghetti. Can spaghetti get really, really close to each other? Sure, you get a big blob on your plate, right? But if these are branches, have you ever tried to get like maybe in the fall or something and you're, you're cleaning up your yard and you have all these sticks and branches on the ground, maybe after a big storm or something, and you're trying to like collect all these branches, but they, they make a big, you know, fat pile and it's hard to pick those up because they're not squishing down together. You can't get those sticks with all these branches close to each other. Well, they can't get close to each other. They can't have attraction towards one another. Okay. So uh, it's not just molar mass, but that's the most common uh, way to think of uh, London dispersion. Okay. So here's problem number three, which halogen has the highest boiling point and why? So Think about it, maybe look at your periodic table and circle the answer you think it is. I think it's letter C, I2. Why? Well, guess what? Hmm. I2 has a higher molar mass. Therefore, it has more electrons. Therefore, it has greater polarizability. It creates those dipoles easier. Therefore, it has greater traction. Therefore, it's greater IMFs. And with uh, greater IMFs, the more energy it takes to separate the, in this case, a solid, uh, therefore, greater boiling point. Yes, iodine is actually a solid at room temperature. Uh, bromine is a liquid at room temperature, and chlorine is a gas at room temperature. Huh, I wonder why. It has everything to do with molar mass, has everything to do with London dispersion force. Right? But that's not the only kind of force out there. Why did we spend so much time on that last uh, video talking about Vesper and polarity? Because I tried to really, you know, um, explain to you that structure determines function. That structure is huge to determine if a molecule is polar or nonpolar because of this. If a molecule is polar, it will have dipole forces, okay? So these exist in all molecules that are polar because polar molecules have partial positive and partial negative regions. This is that Greek letter delta, a small case delta, all right? The capital delta is your triangle, but this is a small case delta, which means partial, all right? Um, so it's partial positives and partial negative regions. If you recall, we talked about originally the idea of a polar bond. So if, if I and, and my partner were sharing those electrons equally, that was nonpolar. But if my partner loved those electrons more, then the electrons hovered closer to the partner, making that partner partially negative, making me partially positive. And you remember what happened at the end? I said, here, just take it. That'd be ionic. That would be a full positive and a full negative. So as long as there still is some sharing of the electrons, we say it's positive, all right? So these have poles, these have partial positive poles and partially negative poles. And here, right here and right here is showing you the traction. So for example, is 2-propanone, all right? And guess what, we're gonna be showing you uh, you know, later on, you know, how did I know that's 2-propanone? Well, you're going to know by the end of this, this uh, class, all right? 
So propanone, it looks like this. So notice we would normally uh, look like this. We've kind of put them in the chain, but I'd rather put it like this because as you know, oxygen is a, you guessed it, a big four. It's a highly electronegative element, so it's going to be your partially negative. Carbon is not a highly electronegative element, therefore this whole region below is partially positive. And when you get a setup that looks like this, well, guess what? You're going to have that attraction between the partial positive area of the ox, or excuse me, the partial negative area of the oxygen and the partial positive of the carbon. All right, let's keep going. Okie dokie. So why don't you take a few minutes out, it may take you more than a few minutes, and draw each of these structures and then determine if the molecule is polar or nonpolar. Okay, so pause this, and I mean this, practice this. Determine the polarity of the molecules, all right? So we'll see you in a few minutes. Bye-bye. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you finished A through E, um, and see how you did. So in this case, here's my carbon dioxide. Hey, I, Mrs. Vandewell, I see these oxygens. Isn't it polar? The answer is no, it's not. Remember, structure also. This is a symmetrical molecule. It's linear, and you have two oxygens off each end. It is a nonpolar molecule, all right? So it does not have dipole forces. It has London dispersion, and that's it. I'm going to go across to HCl, and here's my uh, Lewis dot diagram. Now what? Does this have polarity? The answer is yes, I see a chlorine, all right? So it is a polar molecule, therefore, I have a little check mark, guess what? It has dipole forces. Now look at this next one. All right, let's try it like this. Let's go down one more. Okay, so let's see if I can do this. Yes, oh, I lost my hydrogen. All right, let me go back and grab my hydrogen. All right, here is this one, all right? So it has two chlorines and two hydrogens. And so is it polar? The answer is yes, okay? It is polar. Um, I don't see where I wrote polar. There I see polar, all right? And so it does have dipole forces. But you might be saying, well, Mrs. Vandewell, you have two chlorines here. What if I put my chlorine here? All right, well, I'll have to turn it upside down. All right, will it still be polar? And the answer is yes, all right? So here's my region of partial negative, all right? What if I put my chlorine here instead? Now, aren't these right across from each other? So isn't this where they negate each other and they cancel each other out because it's perfectly symmetrical? The answer is no, this is tetrahedral. So the region of partial negative is like coming out of the page at you. All right, remember, this is about like a, a, like a 107 degree or something like that. Um, so, you know, it's not 180 degrees. So it is still polar no matter where you put the chlorines. So it does have dipole forces, okay? So what about this one? Well, the shape is trigonal planar. It has no lone pairs, but is it symmetrical? No, it's not because I don't have the same element circling the, the carbon. So I see an oxygen, a big four, it is polar, therefore it does have dipole forces. All right, dipole, dipole. So here is the next one, CH4. Is it polar or nonpolar? Well, folks, every single bond here is nonpolar, so it really makes no difference. Even though it is symmetrical, it has both, you know, things going for it to be nonpolar. It's really nonpolar, okay? So what about the next one? I did not you know, finish drawing it because I pretty much drew it for you. So my question to you is, all right, is there a region of partial negative? The answer is yes. This is not symmetrical. This carbon here is trigonal planar. This oxygen here is bent. So this region right here, all right, is your partially negative. So the region on the opposite side is partially positive. All right, so here it is indeed polar. All right, so it indeed has dipole, dipole. All right, now our third case is something called hydrogen bonding. It is a special super duper case of dipole, dipole. Excuse me, it's like dipole, dipole on steroids or something, all right? And so this is where you have polar molecules with nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine 
not chlorine. Why not chlorine? Chlorine's too big. All right. So if you look, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine are all in period two. Chlorine's in period three. It has a whole other shell to increase its size. So for the, the idea of being too big, all right, it's not going to attract uh, the hydrogen of the other molecule. So it, the hydrogen has to be, listen to this, the hydrogen has to be directly attached to the nitrogen and oxygen or fluorine, okay? This intermolecular strength is higher than other dipole-dipole attractions. And in organic chemistry, we talk about water, alcohols, carboxylic acids, amines, and amides having hydrogen bonding. All right, so this is easier. This is your HF, all right, and this is a stronger attraction if we have hydrogen bonding. All right, so what are some things about this? Uh, water has many super important features because of this type of bond, it's hydrogen bonding, all right? So if you look here, hang on, let me do that. There you go. Uh, water has, if you look, here's water. It has a pretty low molar mass compared to these other things, but look how high its boiling point is. So if you were to just look at the molar mass, you would think that, um, you know, it would be way down here with, with maybe the methane or something, but that's not the case. Look how high water's boiling point is compared to everything else. Even this H2TE has a much higher molar mass than water, but it boils at zero degrees at freezing. So it's a gas, all right, um, at almost every temperature that's above freezing, okay? So that molar mass is not enough to overcome and have the same attractions that water does, all right? So high melting and high boiling points, this graph shows it all, okay? It has a high surface tension. That's why, you know, certain things can float on water, like little bugs can, like, you know, race on the water. And that's why, you know, if you've ever tried to put water droplets on a penny, they form the, that bead on top. That's called surface tension, all right? Those water molecules would rather stick together than fall through. So remind me, I do have a demo showing this uh, next time I see you in person. Let's go on the next page. Oh, okie dokie. So let's draw ethanol and dimethyl ether, all right? So just think, before the end of this course, you're going to be able to do this all by yourself. You won't need me to do that for you, okay? Now, I just gave you a real quick structure. Don't forget, oxygen has two lone pairs. It's kind of bent here, and it's also a bent molecule, all right? It's not linear. It's not symmetrical. So the question is, what do they have in common? Ooh, that's a great question. Hey, how many carbons does this have? Two. How many does this one have? Two. How many oxygens? One. One. How many hydrogens does this one have? Let me see here. This has three and two and one. What's three plus two plus one? I think that's six. This is three and three. <gasps> they have the same molar mass. Why? Because they have the same molecular formula. They both are C2H6O. Therefore, the London dispersion forces are the same. So if I were only going to look at just molar mass, I'd say they have every property in common. Well, that's not the case, all right? Why not? Because they have different intermolecular forces. Now, keep in mind, I told you, I made a big deal about this. You may want to write this down. They're both bent. They're both polar, all right? but one is more strongly attracted than the other. They're both polar. So let's see here. Dimethyl ether has London dispersion always and dipole-dipole. Why it's polar? This is a bent molecule. looks like a, a V or something or upside down V. But what about this one? It has London dispersion, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding. Why? Because the H is on the O. The H is directly bonded to the O. Here, the H's are all in the carbons and not on the O. So that's the kind of molecular, intermolecular forces they have. So it says, um, all right, one has a boiling point of negative 22. The other one has a boiling point of 78.3. That's a huge difference. One's a gas at room temperature and one's a liquid uh, until it's really, really hot, okay? Um, you know, on a, a hot 90 degree Fahrenheit day is like in the 30s. So we're talking, um, you know, 100 and something degrees would be the uh, equivalent for Fahrenheit. 
So which one is which? Do you think ethanol is negative 22 or do you think ethanol is uh, 78.3? And as you may have guessed, ethanol is this one. Why it has hydrogen bonding? All right, dimethyl ether is the lower one because it doesn't have hydrogen bonding. All right, so why is that a big deal? So ethanol has a greater intermolecular force. What does that mean? It's greater attraction between the molecules. Therefore, it's going to take more energy to separate the two molecules, so boiling point increases, okay? Let's take a look at the next problem. Well, first of all, I gave you their um, molar masses, so they're not that different. So methanol is 32, uh, carbon monoxide is 28, and methane is 16. So they have similar masses. So it's definitely going to have nothing to do with one dispersion. They're not hugely different, okay? So let's go back. So um, I'm going to write down, well, which is the most influential, all right, um, intermolecular force, all right? They're all going to have London dispersion, so I'm not going to put that down. That's a given. So what is the strongest intermolecular force they have? Well, is this polar? Yes. Why? Because oxygen is bent and it's oxygen. So does it have hydrogen bonding? Yes. Why? Because the oxygen is bonded to the hydrogen. So that has hydrogen bonding. What about this one? Is it polar? Yes, it is polar. It has oxygen and it's not symmetrical. The, is it hydrogen bonding? No, there's no hydrogen on it. So the strongest force is dipole dipole. All right. Is this polar? No, it is perfectly symmetrical and it has none of the big force. So it only has London dispersion. So of these three, just look at that. The molar mass are, are very, very similar. So which one is going to have the highest boiling point? What do you think? Methanol has the hydrogen bonding. Uh, therefore, it's great attractions between the molecules. Therefore, the boiling point increases. All right. So uh, what I would like you to do next is pause this. Fill out this chart, and I mean it. Fill out this chart because this chart is truly what the majority of your test over this intro unit is going to cover. All right, so if you can do this chart, you're going to do a great job on the test. So pause this, maybe spend 10 minutes or so, and finish off um, the chart. And when you're done, come back. I'll be here. Don't you worry. All right, so hopefully you got done, all right, and see how you do. So here's my first one, all right. So I have three chlorines and one hydrogen, so you can put your chlorines anywhere you want. It is tetrahedral, why is four electron groups and no lone pairs. It is definitely polar because I have polar bonds and it's not symmetrical. I don't have the same elements around the central atom. So it is London dispersion di uh, and dipole dipole. There is you know, no oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine to even think about hydrogen bonding. But are there forces? And the answer is yes. So what I did is I took my picture and I made it sideways. Why? Because this region now is my partially negative. My hydrogen is my partial positive. So it says diagrams showing forces. Hey, what's another word for force? Attraction. So here's the attraction between this area underneath the carbon in a sense, and this area above the carbon because you have partial negative and partial positive. All right, what about me um, methane? What do you notice here? CH4, tetrahedral, nonpolar, London dispersions. Are there forces? No. Don't put any forces if it's just London dispersion. All right, let's try the next one. This is actually your dimethyl ether. Remember we talked about that earlier. So I didn't put all the H's in. I didn't really want to. It's bent, polar, and there they are. So what are the forces? I, I still kind of left them. I'll just put them over here. So here's the dimethyl ether. Here's the other dimethyl ether. So the region underneath is partially positive. Why? Because the oxygen on top is partially negative. So once again, here are your attractions, okay? Right here is your attractions, okay? Uh, I'll just go ahead and do it here. Uh, this is acetic acid, so notice I have this area. This right here is trigonal planar. 
this right here is bent. Why is it polar? It's definitely not symmetrical and I see oxygens, all right? So here's my hydrogen bonding. Now look closely. Here's my acetic acid the way I drew it here. And then I rotated this. Why? Because it is the H coming off of the O is attracted to like the partially negative O here. So it has to be the H that is directly attached to either N, O, or F. All right, that's your hydrogen bonding. And over here, here's your ethanol. Uh, again, it's bent, all right? It is polar. It has all these, why? Well, it's polar, it has dipole, dipole, but look at, you have the H directly attached to the O, therefore it's hydrogen bonding. So once again, it is this H right here which is the partial positive where the attraction goes. It has to be that H, not these carbons over here for hydrogen bonding, okay? Well, that's it. Sorry I talked an awful lot, but this is a really important section. Hopefully it was a good review for you as well. And we'll keep referring to all of this as we continue on through organic chemistry. So don't wait to be great. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.